So our subject matter today is inequality and its relation to the, to the themes of our discussion in the course. And the conception of equality, which is most pertinent to economics and also uh, to our discussions about the future, is inequality as shared empowerment, the enhancement of agency. Agency understood as the capacity to act and to transform the world around us. Now, I use the concept of agency in two different but related senses. So let me say a word about that to avoid confusion. So first, agency means this capacity to act for initiative, for transformative initiative. We transform ourselves by transforming the world around us. But in the second sense, agency means the representation of interests and ideals in society, and therefore the organization of coalitions of alliances, both class alliances and political alliances, that can support alternatives like the alternatives we're exploring here. And of course, these two senses are very closely connected because the content of the alternatives has to do with the promotion of empowerment. Yes? Can you check if the mic is on? I'm not sure. Seems to be connected. And maybe you want me to speak more loudly, which I'm happy to do. Uh, so a common conception of economic growth and its conditions is that nine-tenths of economic growth has to do with productivity, with productivity as opposed to the mere accumulation of inputs in the process of production. And productivity, in turn, has to do, on one side, with people's capabilities, and on the other side with their machines, with their technology. Now, theoretically, it's possible to imagine a society in which all the most significant technologies that underlie the growth of productivity belong to a small class of people, the asset holders, the moneyed interests. A simple way to imagine that is, as suggested in the title of one of the pieces we'll be reading later, the robots are all owned by the elite. Uh, and that would mean that the basis of productivity would lie mainly in these technologies, rather than in the broadening of the base of the capabilities of the people. Now, of course, there are limits to this possibility. The first social limits, of course, because in a society that is so radically unequal, there will be conflict and tension, and eventually the order that allows the asset holders to control the machines is likely to be undermined. But on the other hand, there are also direct economic limits because the use of these technologies is likely to require some level of capabilities in the population, even in those parts of the population that are not the owners of the robots. What is realistic is to suppose that unlike what the liberals and socialists of the 19th century imagined, there's no guaranteed convergence between the conditions of economic growth on the one hand and the conditions of greater equality and inclusion on the other hand. But there is a subset of the possible growth paths that also promotes equality and inclusion and a subset of policies committed to equality and inclusion that also support growth. That minimalist thesis of the possible overlap between these conditions seems to be the most realistic assumption. 
Now, what I propose today is to divide my discussion into three parts. In the first part of the discussion, I want to return to the consideration that I proposed a few weeks ago of three principles that govern the relation of distribution or redistribution to inequality. In the second part of the discussion, I want to make some remarks about the shape of the ideological conflict today and the proper place of equality or inequality in the ideological debate. And then in the third part of, the, of today's argument, I want to return to a theme which I took up at the end of class last time, about agency in the second sense, that is to say, the social and political alliances that could support alternatives like the ones that we have been discussing. So first, Remember the proposal of those three principles about distribution, redistribution, and inequality. The first principle was that structural change trumps anything that can be done by way of compensatory redistribution. Uh, so we imagine that there are two distributions of economic opportunity an advantage in society. There is the primary or fundamental distribution of advantage and opportunity. The one that results from the institutional arrangements, especially the institutional arrangements of the market order, but also the institutional arrangements of politics. The second distribution of advantage and opportunity the secondary or derivative distribution is the one that results from attempts to correct the consequences of the primary distribution. Now, you remember my fundamental thesis with respect to that first principle is that the primary distribution is much more important and that the secondary distribution can have only a very limited effect. Now, what is the intuitive basis for this idea? The intuitive basis is the notion that any attempt to correct the primary distribution is likely to derange the established economic institutions and undermine the established economic incentives to save, invest, and employ. So suppose we have a primary distribution that results in radical inequality. And then we attempt to correct it after the fact through compensatory redistribution, especially by tax and transfer, that is, progressive taxation on the revenue-raising side of the budget and redistributive spending on the spending side of the budget, spending or entitlements. If the inequalities are massive, the compensatory redistribution will also have to be massive. And, I argued, long before it reaches the requisite threshold to produce the effects that we need to annul the massive inequalities, to compensate for them, it will begin to derange the institutions of the established economy and to exact what seems to be an unacceptable cost in lost output. This tension between the primary and the secondary redistribution is captured in the familiar rhetorical apparatus of contrast between equity and efficiency. This rhetorical apparatus treats as necessary and universal what is in fact attention specific to one particular order, the order that generates those inequalities and then the attempt to correct those inequalities after the fact, retrospectively, through tax and transfer. Now, the thesis of institutionally conservative social democracy with respect to this problem is that generally 
with the, the, the institutionally conservative social democrats call compensatory redistribution is more efficient than uh, a <coughs> intervention in the market economy to produce an equalizing effect. Uh, but this thesis uh, has two questionable premises. The first premise is the underlying assumption that there is a single natural and necessary form of the market order. So the institutionally conservative social democrats discard the possibility that the, a market economy could be organized in a radically different way, and that in this radically different way, it would produce different effects, including different effects for equality and inequality. The second questionable assumption of this thesis is the failure to accommodate the extent to which an extension of compensatory redistribution, what I'm calling the secondary distribution, is likely to undermine the established economic arrangements and incentives. And as a result, to exact an unacceptable economic cost. So I directly oppose that idea in the arguments we've been having in previous weeks. But now let's open this black box of the idea of structural change in the economy. Because after all, the thesis is that structural change is much more important than compensatory redistribution to diminish the degree of inequality. So what is meant by structural change? And what kind of structural change do we have in view when we speak this way? So first there's the idea that the market order, the architecture of the market economy, should not be fastened to a single dogmatic version of itself. That's the basic analytic premise of all of these arguments. There is no single natural and necessary way of organizing a market economy. And no single and necessary way of relating, for example, even at the most abstract level, the absolute degree of economic decentralization, the number of economic agents able to bargain on their own initiative and for their own account, and the relative degree of control, the absoluteness of the control that each of those agents has at the resources, over the resources at his disposal. We might, for example, going back to an idea that I brought up in the very first class of the course, we might be able to extend the degree of absolute decentralization by limiting the absoluteness of the control that each of the, those decentralized agents has over those resources, establishing a system of claims on resources that is temporary, conditional, and fragmentary in different ways. Disassembling the property right, investing its component features in different kinds of, 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 of partial owners or temporary owners. So the second element then in this idea of structural change is the notion that we could expand the range of economic agents who have access to the most advanced practice of production. In our epoch, it's the knowledge economy. Uh, a different way of saying that is that we imagine a different way of disseminating the most advanced practice throughout the economy. A third component is the idea that we make free labor really free. Uh, so, as I mentioned, the liberals and socialists of the 19th century believe that economically dependent wage labor was a deficient form of free labor, destined to give way in the course of time to the higher forms of free work, self-employment, and cooperation. 
and they were unable to show how these higher forms of free labor could be accommodated to the relentless imperative of economies of scale in a complex modern economy. That would require innovations in the property regime, which is precisely what they failed to offer. Then a fourth component is the idea that finance should be made a good servant rather than being allowed to be a bad master. We should enlist finance in the service of the productive agenda of society, and we should transform the institutional arrangements that govern the relation of finance to the real economy. We're going to come to that subject after the recess and to a more detailed discussion of the relation of labor to capital. Uh, a sixth component is the idea that these structural changes are much more likely to happen in a society with a radically experimentalist culture. Therefore, the change of culture of consciousness is just as important as the change of institutions. And a seventh component is the idea that the other part of the background that is necessary to affirm this primacy of structural over non-structural change is the creation of a high energy democracy with a higher temperature, a quicker pace, and a greater combination of decisive central initiative and radical devolution. A higher energy democracy is a democracy that weakens the dependence of change on crisis. So institutions with these attributes, especially with the last two that I mentioned, the experimentalist culture and the high energy democracy as part of their background, are then have an experimentalist quality. They are institutions that invite their own revision in the light of experience. So that's the general idea of structural change. And the fundamental thesis then, enunciated by this first principle, is that such structural change has primacy over non-structural change, over the attempt to correct after the fact, the inequalities generated by the market order. Now, these three theses are in a hierarchical ranking. So then we come to the second thesis, subordinate to the first. And the second thesis says, although compensatory redistribution is less significant, less potent than structural change, it nevertheless has a role. But in order to appreciate its role correctly, we must understand that compensatory redistribution must take account of both sides of the budget, the revenue raising side and the spending side. It must not focus solely on the progressive profile of the budget on its revenue raising side. And I developed that idea through a reflection on what seems to be a paradox, that the American tax system is on paper more progressive than the tax systems of the European social democracies, because it attributes a larger role to the progressive taxation of personal incomes, whereas the European systems are heavily dependent on the avowedly regressive and indirect taxation of consumption, especially through the flat rate comprehensive value added tax or any set of functional equivalents to it. And the explanation of this paradox then, which is the essence of the second principle, is that what matters most to the egalitarian effect of the budget is not just how progressive it is on its revenue raising side, but the aggregate level of the tax take and how it is then spent. And 
the aggregate level of the tax take may be increased more easily through the use of a tax that is neutral with respect to the system of relative prices. And that then is the beginning of an explanation of this paradox that I cited. So if we have a tax that is neutral with respect to relative prices in the economy, we can raise the aggregate tax take while minimizing the resulting economic confusion, the disturbance to the established incentives to save, to invest, and employ. And then, the hope is, stated by the second principle, everything that we have lost by way of progressivity on the revenue-raising side of the budget, we can gain in double on the spending side. And that would be, then, the explanation of the apparent paradox. So we sacrifice pro progressivity on the revenue-raising side, but we affirm it on the spending side. And this would be a key to the understanding of what has been the greatest historical achievement of European social democracy, despite its many failings. Its greatest historical achievement, I argue, has been to sustain a high level of investment in people and their capabilities. Through social entitlements like the public options for education and for health. Now, this has an oblique and indirect effect on equality, but its most important effect is on productivity and inclusion. And then we come to the third principle in this hierarchy of three principles, which is that once we have established the tax system on the basis of consumption, the avowedly regressive and indirect taxation of consumption, it's easy to incorporate into it a directly egalitarian and redistributive element, even on the revenue-raising side. So what happens with proposals for this comprehensive flat rate value added tax is that the left doesn't like them because they're regressive, and the right doesn't like them if their intention is to raise the tax take. So no one is in favor of this, uh, although this might seem to be the most rational way to solve the problem in the short run. The most rational way would be to promote structural changes, like the structural changes we've been discussing, but then to complement them with this high level of investment in people and their capabilities. To do what European social democracy has achieved and what it hasn't achieved, structural change. So the third principle says that once we've set up the tax system this way, uh, we can then have a directly progressive tax on individualized consumption. So the underlying idea is that direct progressive taxation has two main targets. One target is the hierarchy of living standards. The second target is the accumulation of economic power. After all, someone can have a very modest standard of living uh, but use all of that accumulated wealth to exercise power over people directly by hiring them and indirectly by its political influence. Now, the accumulation of economic power is a much more difficult target to reach. And it depends really fundamentally on the reorganization of the economy the subject of structural change. The most efficient way to reach it in taxation is through the taxation of inheritance and anticipated inheritance by gifts in survival. That is, to reach it at the moment of death. On the other hand, the hierarchy of standards of living is relatively easy to reach 
through a tax, through an individualized tax on consumption. And I gave the example of the Caldor tax, a tax which taxes on a steeply progressive rate the difference between the aggregate income of the individual, the total income, the total returns to labor and to capital, and invested savings. And that difference is what the individual spends on his own standard of living. That difference can be very, can be taxed on a steeply progressive scale. You could say beneath a certain level, the individual pays nothing, he receives from the government. That's what Americans call the negative income tax. Then the rate steeply progressives as the standard of living of the individual climbs. And beyond a certain level of luxury living, the sky's the limit because the ceiling of the rate of such a tax is not 100%. It could be multiples of 100%. We could say that for every dollar the individual spends on his own standard of living, he pays three or four dollars to the state. And that would be the way to use taxation for redistributive purposes if we really wanted to. And of course, it seems that we don't really want to. And the place of the rhetoric of progressive taxation in the discourse of the leftist politicians seems to be less to signal an effective strategy of redistribution, which would point in the direction of structural change, than an announcement of whose side they're on. We're on the side of the workers, we're on the side of the dispossessed majority, and so forth. So that's then the first part of what I wanted to say to today, and let me stop again and ask for your remarks having gone back to this discussion and attempted to restate it in the light of the discussions of the previous two weeks. Yes? Why not just have progressive taxation in the first place? Why, I, mean, I understand your argument that you can have a regressive, a regressive or flat model like a VAT and then build progressivity into it, but why not, what's, what's your argument? Why not go directly to the individualized tax on consumption? No, what's your argument against the progress, uh, the income tax or the bill, you know, billionaire's tax, wealth tax? No, those are different questions. So, so, so we have to, we have to, we have to uh, distinguish them. No? Ta a, a wealth tax on very rich people is a confused thing because, uh, as I say, what is the objective? Is the objective limiting the hierarchy of standards of living or is the objective limiting economic power? They're, those are two different objectives. The problem of the income tax conceptually is the income tax is a hybrid tax which is not squarely directed at either of these two targets and fails to hit either of them squarely. In practice, we know that all around the world the income tax is mainly a tax on the salaries of the so-called middle class. Rich people have many ways to escape the income tax, and on the whole, they don't pay the income tax. So the income tax is, is, is not dealing with this problem of radical economic inequality. And it's a, a, it's, it's a blunt instrument. It's an ineffective instrument to hit these two distinct these two distinct tar targets. Now, there is a reason to want to have a high tax take in a relatively inclusive, open, advanced economy. The reason is to be able to invest in the capabilities of the population, in its security, in its health, in its education. And that's what then has led the European social democracies to rely on the instrument of regressive taxation. In or, if they were to try to fund their high entitlement systems simply by direct taxation, individualized taxation, it would have to be massive. Uh, and uh, it would probably then begin to exercise a series of negative economic effects which, wouldn't, which would not be allowed. Now, in wartime, it's different. 
in the, in the Second World War in the United States, at a certain moment, the highest rate of the income tax was over 90%. So that was a confiscatory tax. But that is usually not uh, considered acceptable in peacetime. And it would have, in peacetime, probably a series of unintended negative effects on, on production. It begins to derange these established incentives of the organized economy, the incentives to save, to invest, and to employ. Uh, so that's the basic reason. So th then we come to the fact, why, well, wh why, not, why not then attempt to hit directly these two targets of progressive taxation? If they really want redistribution by taxation, here's how to do it. We can have a wealth tax that is quite radical beyond the certain modest amounts, the modest amounts appropriate to a property-owning democracy, but the accumulation of wealth should be annulled. And the easiest time to annul it by taxes is the time of death, through inheritance, or its anticipation by gifts into virus. And similarly, we can have a steeply progressive tax on individualized consumption, as I just explained. But I think that is unlikely to serve the purposes of the state in sustaining a high tax level. For this reason that we want to invest in, in people and in their capability, in their health, in their security, in their education, that takes a huge amount of money in these societies, a huge part of GDP. Now, how are we to do that other than by a tax that leaves the established economic arrangements and incentives relatively intact. That's what this comprehensive flat rate value added tax does. Because thinking about it conceptually, what it does is it takes from every transformation of an input into an output and the subsequent aggregation of value a constant amount. So it, 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 even in conception, it allows them to maximize the tax take, but to minimize the economic trauma. It has a problem. The problem is that it's regressive. Uh, the, the Social Democrats could say, be patient. Everything that we've lost by progressivity on the revenue rating side, we're going to gain later on the entitlement side. That's the answer. Huh? But it's a partial answer because we can, we can have this high tax take, but at the same time incorporate a very sharp element of progressivity if we really want to. This historical experience suggests that we may not really want to. Yes? I think, I think you just answered my question, but uh, just to clarify, so just in terms of sort of the, the public budgeting, you're saying that uh, a, a VAT tax or flat tax would generate more revenue than a progressive income tax? Or Undoubtedly. Okay, got yeah. it. Undoubt and for a reason, the re not by accident, for the reason that it is conceptually the most neutral economic tax. It's a tax that doesn't mess with the price system. Um, second question is, I, one of the readings, um, the I think it was more of a, overview of, a, of a, some conference on inequality that one of the assigned readings that Roderick yes. um, wrote. Um, it seemed like there is almost universal consensus that traditionally we've thought about the sort of the equity uh, or the, the um, yeah, the equity uh, efficiency trade-off, but um, that sort of one of the big conclusions of that conference was that economists no longer see them as at odds with one another, but it re income, or increasing in income inequality is actually reducing our productivity potential because yes. they're a huge sloth. So I guess, how do you reconcile that? Or do you disagree with Roderick in that perspective? Or how do you sort of reconcile that <coughs> there may not be a trade-off between equity and efficiency? Well, I'm, I, don't, I don't see exactly the contradiction. So saying, uh, so, uh, the question, the question is how, how equity, 
what equity means and how it's to be achieved. If it is achieved by compensatory redistribution, it has all of the problems that I discussed. If it is achieved by structural change, that's a totally different story. So I don't necessarily disagree with this thesis. Uh, but what's crucial is to distinguish whether the higher equity is to be achieved structurally or non-structurally. Uh, the institutionally conservative social democrat thinks it's irrational to try and do it structurally because that's messing up with the economic order. The economic order is the goose that lays the golden eggs. It's this great motor for producing wealth. Don't mess with it. Just compensate for what it has done after the fact through progressive re That's how they propose to achieve equity. But uh, if, the, if the compensatory redistribution has to be very large, it's going to mess up the economic order. So we're, we discussed this change in the advanced practice of production, the decline of for this mass production and the emergence of the insular knowledge economy. So for this mass production was the, was the basis, it was the practical economic basis of historical social democracy. Uh, the workers, a stable labor force assembled in large productive units, factories, under the aegis of large corporations. And uh, that was the core historical constituency of social democracy. Now we have a world in which that's falling apart. Those industries are vanishing, they're declining. They survive mainly in parts of the world with low, low wages and low tax rates. So there's this relentless tax and wage arbitrage going on in the world. <coughs> and now we have this vanguard, which is insular, which retreats into its core. And the abyss between the vanguards and the rear guards is deeper and deeper. In that world, it's not possible to solve this problem by simple redistribution unless the redistribution is massive. That's the problem that's being discussed. We need to have a direct strategy to address the abyss between the vanguards and rear guards. Now, when Roderick and other people say we'll achieve greater equity and equity will promote growth, my interpretation is that they're signaling in the direction of structural changes and not just of compensatory redistribution. Then it's, then it's everything we want. So this is not an argument against equality or, or inclusion. It's an argument of saying, stop venerating the established form of the market order and sugarcoating its social consequences through compensatory redistribution. If you really are embarked on a, on a trajectory of structural change, these other things, these entitlements have a role. Their first role, as I say, is not equality. Their first role is to finance the state and to promote this high level of, of entitlements, of, of capabilities of people. And this will have a significant egalitarian effect. But if you want to go further in the direction of compensatory equality, then you have to do it by these other fiscal means. That's the kind of argument. One follow-up question. Yeah. Um, the structural changes that, that are required to achieve, um, yeah, to, to achieve all of this, um, won't they themselves have significant distortions in the economy that are comparable to the size of progressive taxation? Like, I can't imagine this doesn't have any impact on... Well, on well we have to distinguish now two kinds of distortions. And this is an important question that you raise, and it, per, it, it leads to a, a, a vital clarification. So one thing is the, the trouble that results from a transition of regime, from one regime to another, from one way of organizing a market economy to another. And there will be some price to pay for that, always. Uh, but the other kind of distortion is you maintain the present order, the present organization of the market, 
and you simply try and create a secondary distribution to replace the primary distribution. That's a very different kind of distortion because that's not a distortion that, as it were, corrects itself. Because in this flux, what you're saying is there'll be a price to pay for the transition, a moment of conflict and uncertainty, but you'll end up with a different regime, which will have a different set of arrangements and incentives and will itself be stable. But now it will be stable with a higher degree of equality and inclusion. The other is, you'll say, you'll maintain the regime, but you'll try keeping to keep undoing it. So to take a, 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 just a simple example of that, suppose you have an agrarian economy and you say, well, uh, the farmers are free to, to, as, to be entrepreneurs. Some will flourish, others will fail. Uh, and then after the fact, you'll have an agrarian reform bureau which every time someone begins to extend his land holding and to reduce other farmers to tenants or wage laborers, they'll correct it. They'll come in and say, no, you can't do that. There's a, there's a, a radical restraint on alienation of land. You can't hire farmers to work for you and so on and so forth. So in other words, you maintain the regime, but you cancel it out after the fact. That's a different kind of cost, because that's a cost that is, is not going to fix itself. It's going to create a permanent contradiction between the regime and its compensatory antithesis. So that's the crucial distinction between these two <coughs> kinds of costs. Yes? Uh, Professor, what are your thoughts on the idea of a baby bond system, where the government basically gives a, I guess, a pension of sorts so someone raised the question with respect to minimum guaranteed income. It's a similar question, huh? which you say, because they're all variations on the same thing. So one could have a basic st set of resources which are settled on the individual, or a minimum income which the individual has. So the basic idea is an idea of a social inheritance. Instead of a few people inheriting from their families, Everyone inherits from the state a minimum set of resources. And I would say that's in principle a good idea, but it could mean two very different things. So in the agenda of institutionally conservative social democracy, what it means is you create this haven for people. You take things out of the market, you, 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 you safeguard a basic package of guarantees and capability assuring endowments. And one of them would be these baby bonds, these, these resources. That, for example, you establish a trust for every individual that he can draw on at turning points in his life when he sets up a business, when he establishes a family, and so forth. So that will mean two different things if this idea of having a haven is the counterpart to some attempt to open society up to this storm of experimentation and innovation, or if it's just an end in itself. So in institutionally conservative social democracy, there's the discourse about the haven, but there's no discourse about the storm. So in order to know whether the, how good an idea the haven is, or how, how big it should be, I have to know about the other part, the part about the storm. In the discourse of social democracy, that's always the missing part. So that's, that's the discussion that would begin there. And the storm is not just the economic storm of participation in this experimentalist or innovation economy, it's also the storm in politics. Will there be a form of politics that requires an exogenous shock in the form of war or economic ruin to make change possible? Or will we organize democratic politics in such a way that it renders the impulse to change endogenous to society, which is another expression of the storm. So, and I think that the whole temper of social democracy has been 
We'll guarantee people. We'll give them these entitlements. We'll protect them against economic insecurity. But we won't rearrange the system that defines the market order and therefore access to its productive resources and opportunities. So that puts the Social Democrats in the situation of being the humanizers of the conservative project. So they're the ones who define the agenda of production, and then the Social Democrats come after the fact and say, we won't allow it to be so savage. We're going to put a human face on it. And that's what I argued is the losing position in politics. So that's, that's the beginning of another debate, and a, a very central debate to all of this. Yes? between the, uh, flat, uh, the flat PAT and the establishment of uh, what you call this uh, deeply progressive uh, tax on consumption. Well, what do you mean, what would be the turning when, point? When we will switch from the, the one to the other? We could switch tomorrow if we really believe in these things, right? I mean, many, many of the tax authorities, for example, take the professors of tax law in the American research universities now, in, in the law schools, the elite law schools like Harvard, Yale, and so forth. I would say that about half of them are proponents of the Caldor tax. The Caldor tax is a purely academic idea. It has never been implemented. Uh, and no significant political force in the West is supporting it. But the experts are, a very large part of them are in favor of it. So what's preventing this from happening? Uh, so I think it's a political complication, right? That, uh, as I say, the, the, the rhetoric of progressive taxation is a way in which the politicians signal whose side they are, they're on. If they're really redistributing, why don't they go forward to this other thing? Not, nothing is preventing them. It, it requires... It's, uh, a pedagogic breakthrough, because it's all dialectical or paradoxical. Huh? For first, you use a, a regressive tax to produce a progressive result. Then you come and create this strange tax on the hierarchy of standards of living. So all of this has to be explained. But that's what democratic politics should be. It should be enlightenment, also. But it's a tall order. Does it seem mysterious to you why this doesn't happen? I, I don't know, because I remember <laughs> when uh, you know, I was doing my, my bachelor in Europe, I remember that we were told that the, the flat VIT tax is the most unequal tax that we That's can have. That's the point. That's part of the difficulty. So the flat rate value added tax is an avowedly regressive tax. It's very, si it's very simple. The, the poor spend a much greater percentage of their income on consumption than the rich. The rich save part of their income and that becomes economic power. So everyone who is on the surface progressive will be against it. But they've forgotten an essential point. The practical consequence of the, of the VAT, of the neutral taxation of consumption, is to raise the tax take. The Americans take in at least 10% of GDP less than the Europeans as a tax take. That's the, basic, that's the simple basic reason why the United States is less egalitarian in its budget than the Europeans. It has nothing to do with the progressive profile of, of taxation. It has everything to do with the aggregate level of the tax take. That's, that's a simple explanation. Yes? I think it, part of the reason, at least in my sort of American perspective, it, it sounds like a two-step process, right? First, you have to change the, the, the tax code so that it's a, a value-added tax. But then you actually have to make sure... That it is spent progressively. Exactly, right? which exactly. is to bundle those things, two things together, um, you know, very difficult, you know, very difficult, very, because yeah. look, at, look at what's been happening in the United States. Many of the recent projects of the American state 
or in fact subsidies to capital. You know, the Health Care Act, the CARES Act, uh, they're, they're, they're not this creation of a universal public option. But it is very significant in Europe uh, when I say European social democracy has retreated to this last line of defense, which is the preservation of a high level of entitlement, paradoxically financed by the regressive taxation of consumption. It's been liberalized, so all the guarantees of workers are being <coughs> diluted or watered down. Uh, and this is the last line of defense, right? Uh, and uh, uh, there's no project for the reorganization of production. There's no productivist project. The main theme in this course is the productivist project. The social democrats are the humanizers of the inevitable. They're the sugar coders. They're not the people who are bringing a different view of innovation, of energy, of creation, of construction, which is everything that counts in, 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 in the ability to dominate the agenda of politics. So it is extremely difficult. Uh, and uh, unlikely to happen in the short term. That is, none of this could happen, right, as a kind of gift of an enlightened technocracy to a confused population. There has to be some kind of struggle, and the struggle has to be over the form of production. So if you have a, an attempt to escape from the insularity of the knowledge economy and to broaden access to these advanced capabilities and resources, that creates a climate in which redistribution can be thought about in this other way. Huh? And we're going to come today at the end to this discussion of agency of the coalition, which I began at the end of class last time. But I don't, I don't minimize the, the the consequences of this, but how are we to understand this paradoxical situation? It's, it's, not, it's complicated, but it's not that complicated, right? If, if you want, if none of the basic problems of the United States can be solved within the limits of the present American tax base. The American government simply doesn't take in enough taxes. And now a significant part of what it does take in in taxation, it spends on subsidies to capital. Yes? So my main question is, how necessary do you view the direct tax on economic power in terms of its role in like making sure this bad flat tax system would, would function? Because to me, it seems like the biggest appeal of a bad flat, a flat tax system in general is that you can kind of persuade people to buy into more universal systems because they are paying seemingly equivalently amounts, right? So I was going to say uh, that it is an interesting observation, it's an empirical observation in Europe that no right-wing government in Europe has ever succeeded in uh, relinquishing the system of high entitlement. So tax takes in Europe under right-wing governments have only been marginally lightened. There's never been a significant diminishment of the tax take. And the reason is very simple. The population understands that the high tax take is necessary to sustain those entitlements. The whole, almost the whole population, no one wants to give it up once it's established. So that's a huge achievement. It's a political achievement which has proved irrevocable. It's, 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 it's there for keeps. The problem is that it's become the limit. It's become the horizon. So, and this functions in a perverse way in the United States because many of the American progressive politicians, candidates for the presidency and so forth, seem to think that the best thing that could happen 
to the United States that it would become the Sweden of 1970s. So it's a mythical idea of Sweden, but that's the idea. So we would just add onto the American system this, this uh, element of this, this haven. Huh? Uh, and I think that's too little. That's an impoverished conception of the future. But you could see how they would come to that. Yes? On the, um, the question of this actual transformation actually happening in like real life in American politics, um, I'm kind of wondering what you think of as the time horizon. Even if you just think about like the Senate, Democrats will probably lose the Senate with the next election. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of, uh, like the system in which, you know, Democrats represent tens of millions of less people than Republicans isn't gonna change probably anytime soon. And that's just thinking you need a majority to do things through budget reconciliation, let alone, you know, what you need to overcome sure. the filibuster. So are you thinking we abolish the filibuster, you know, this happens in, however many years, the, the next Senate election after the next one? Like, wh when do you think these kind I of things I have no happen? idea. I mean, this is, this is a, a contextual question. This is not a course about the United States. This is a course about political economy in general in the world. And I think that in order for there to be a transformation of any kind, there has to be the idea of the transformation. So I think one of the basic problems now is that the idea doesn't exist. So how could the thing itself ever exist? The idea is obviously not enough, but without the idea, how can you have it? So I think the focus here is on having the conception. Huh? Uh, and if the conceptions are powerful enough, then people can find a way to implement them. That's what I think. Uh, to translate them into a discourse that everyone can understand and to fight for them. But if, if, we, if we don't imagine this possibility, how could we ever hope to have it? So that, that's the level of which I'm thinking. And I, I understand. So there are, there are many problems. Like uh, on the whole, the American progressives uh, idealized Roosevelt's New Deal. So they failed to come up with a sequel to Roosevelt they should be realistic about the, the, the New Deal. The New Deal was focused on economic, on the restabilization of the economy rather than on its democratization and on antidotes to economic insecurity. That's what the New Deal did. A new program, a new moment, would have to be focused on the democratization of capabilities and opportunities the knowledge economy for the many, as I called it, uh, and economic empowerment. Uh, that's a different agenda from, from the New Deal. <coughs> and, and that's what we... But it's an agenda which I think in the United States would be very resonant with many themes in American history. Because after all, the the essential approach to equality that I'm taking in this discussion is that equality has to do with the enhancement of agency, with the ability to act. The, the, the constructive genius, the capabilities of the ordinary man and woman. And that's, that's the genius of the country. That's, that's the essential faith. That's the message of the American prophets. Uh, uh, a message that from the outset bore a taint, a double taint, I think, an inadequate view of the relation of self-construction to solidarity and an institutional idolatry. This idea that a free economy, a free democracy have a natural form, that they discovered it, and now it's for keeps. But nothing is for keeps. So I think that some element of criticism of this prophetic message is required and not just the enactment of the message. And this happens in historical time. It doesn't happen in the biographical time in which we live. These political projects succeed or fail over time in historical time, and we want it to happen right now for us. 
But things, things, things aren't like that. Yes? Kind of going off that last point, and you've mentioned in previous classes about the need for a heightened social co cohesion, social trust. Um, do you think that, you know, people who have been pretty heterogeneous, both you know, geographically, racially, economically, et cetera, um, that this type of transformation that you're talking about might be more likely to be seen in a more homogeneous country, like a European, European no, country? No, no. So, so the question there is where does this cohesion come from, right? Uh, and under institutionally conservative social democracy, the instrument of cohesion are money transfers organized by the state against the background of a high degree of cultural, ethnic, religious homogeneity. So most of the European nations were tribes. That's what most nations were in world history until recently. And tribes governed by, shaped by consanguinity and a similarity. Huh? Now, what happens is that then the heightening of pluralism, of heterogeneity, uh, accentuated by migratory flows, uh, you, uh, makes patent the inadequacy of money as a social cement. So money is not an adequate social cement. People cannot have achieved cohesion <coughs> through money transfers. So when the background of homogeneity is eroded, the inadequacy of money becomes manifest. The only adequate basis for social cohesion in these societies is collective action, people doing many things together, purposive action of people from different walks of life. Cohesion is created by joint action, by joint engagement. And so you have to imagine the multiplicity of forms that this engagement could take. Education organized cooperatively, the provision of public services involving some element of partnership of the state with civil society, acting through cooperatives to partner with the state in the cooperative and experimental provision of public services. So in other words, the state gives a universal minimum. The state operates at the ceiling in the development and funding of the costliest public services. But in the broad middle zone between the floor and the ceiling, the state partners with independent civil society, not for profit for the provision of public services. Social service and military service, uh, voluntary or mandatory as a general principle. Everyone in society has a double role, a place in the production system or in the system of skilling, and a place in helping to take care of other people beyond the boundaries of family selfishness. As a universal principle, social service. And if there isn't mandatory military service for everyone, then those who are exempted from military service should be subject to mandatory social service. So in other words, the accumulation of these different forms of collective action is what creates cohesion. And this capacity for the enhancement of agency uh, interacts with this background of cohesion, driven by purposive action, purposeful action, beyond the boundaries of the family. That's what I would say. So we're dealing here with one aspect of these problems, which are the economic problems, but against this background in which everything else is pertinent. Now I then want to go on to the second part of my discussion, which is the ideological debate and the role of equality in that debate. So the shape of the conventional ideological debate today is that it is shallow freedom against shallow equality. So the conservatives or the right would be those who prioritize freedom against the background of the established economic and political arrangement. And the left would be those who, pre or progressives, would be those who prioritize equality against the same background. So shallowness refers then 
to the acceptance of the institutional presuppositions and the ideological representations with which they're associated. Now, uh, so for example, the theories of distributed <coughs> justice that are influential in the United States or the Anglo-American countries, like the Rawlsian theory of distributed justice. They, on the, on, the, on the surface, they appear to be egalitarian, even radically egalitarian. But in context, they combine this egalitarian profession of faith with an institutional agnosticism or skepticism. And if you sum up the egalitarian faith with the institutional skepticism or agnosticism, the result of that sum is then the justification of compensatory redistribution. So the theories of justice, although seem to be very abstract and have this whole conceptual contraption of original positions, veil of ignorance, and so forth, are a kind of pseudo-philosophical prop to the homely practices of compensatory redistribution under institutionally conservative social democracy. That's what they are. Uh, so they're philosophical justifications of that practice. If you thought that fundamental, ch the change that matters is structural change and not compensatory redistribution, you wouldn't be interested in that kind of theory. Uh, you, you would be interested in what, is, what, what are the institutions the economic and political institutions that allow you to combine equality with agency, with action, leads you in a completely different direction. So what is the alternative then to shallow equality for the progressives? Is the alternative deep equality? So deep equality would be the idea that what matters most at the end of the day is substantive equality of outcome or circumstance. Now, I think no one is really interested in that. The, the objective is not a rigid equality of, of, the, of the living circumstances of the outcome of the wealth, like uh, mythical Sparta, the mythical Rome. Everyone is poor, but they're equally poor and so forth. The objective for the 19th century liberals and socialists was becoming bigger. The ordinary man and woman becomes bigger, but we become bigger together. More agency, shared agency, and inequality is, radical inequality is then an impediment to the sharing of agency. That's the idea. So on this redefinition of the distinction between right and left, the right the conservatives are the ones who think that it is natural for human life to be small, except when there are wars or great calamities and then everyone is, is, is raised out of his rut and we have the sacrificial devotions of war. Uh, or there is an elite of heroes, of geniuses, of saints, of great entrepreneurs and inventors for whom life is not little. But for everyone else, it's natural for life to be little. The progressives on this view would be the ones who think it's not natural for life to be little. And we can become bigger, but we, we can only become bigger together. And this, these economic arguments that we're having are simply a facet of that idea of shared empowerment. The second distinction between the right and the left on this revised interpretation is that the right, the conservatives, are the ones who believe that we pursue our interests and ideals within the horizon of the established and inherited institutional arrangement. And the left, or the progressives, are the ones who believe that we have to transgress those boundaries. We have to cross those frontiers. But we don't cross those frontiers in the way in which Marxist theory imagined, by big systemic substitution, taking one indivisible system, capitalism, and replacing it by another, socialism. We cross it by fragmentary but cumulative change. 
radical reform, which is structural in consequence, in its content, but almost always piecemeal. It's piecemeal, but it can become, it can be cumulative in its effect and even revolutionary in its consequences. So what results from that is a different understanding of the distinction between right and left in which the two, the two attributes that define the progressives on that view are first that they have this idea that we become greater or bigger together and second that they propose to do so by structural change, by change that is structural but typically gradual and piecemeal but with the potential to be cumulative. Of course, on that redefinition of the distinction between progressive and conservative, almost none of the existing progressives are on the progressive side. Everyone is on the other side by this definition. So the progressive side is empty. It's an empty army until it, until it recruits more people. Uh, but so my thesis there is that the inherited view of the distinction between right and left makes no sense. It results in this diminished view of what it means to be a progressive, this kind of sugarcoating or humanization. But the alternative view is not yet established. And I just proposed an example of an alternative view. That's an alternative view which is not yet accepted. Uh, uh, and would result in, in, in excluding from the progressive camp almost all of the actual progressives who are around. So let me ask for your comments about the second set of statements. Uh, it is, in a way, what it's doing is it's affirming a view of the distinction between right and left which is much closer to the view of the 19th century than it is close to the view of the late 20th century. So in the late 20th century, what prevailed was this contest between shallow equality and shallow freedom. And clearly the aim was never radical equality. The aim of the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, Karl Marx, John Stuart Mill, was not the humanization of society, it was the divinization of humanity. It was a much larger idea. And this idea was to be accomplished through change that is structural but cumulative. Uh, so it, and it's the extension of this notion of the enhancement of agency, which to me is the point at which economics most deeply intersects our political aspirations. No one wants to comment on this? All right. Yes. Do you think there's a component of like identity um, that's missing in this conceptualization of right versus left? Um, like that people's motivation is less about um, this ideological, uh, sort of like econo more economic way of looking at it, and it's more reactionary based on based on identity and groups. But what exactly is the question then? I guess like to to me, a lot of uh, the right left divide now is less explained by people's kind of feelings about the role of government or the role of individual freedom versus equality in society, and it's more explained by identity dynamics. I'm just wondering how you think about that interplay and whether that matters. Well, of course, it's perplexing because, again, in the United States, the two main political parties are, they're both parties that are parties of capital in a sense. The, the base of the Democratic Party is like the credentialized, the credentialized section of the working class and the Republican Party is the uncredentialized section. And uh, uh, so in, in, in the politics of any real country, it's, it's sort of mixed up, right? Uh, 
but the, the question that I raise is a philosophical question. What understanding of the progressives and conservatives would be useful for us in imagining a new contest, uh, a contest in which the options would be clear? So the conservative is the one who says, this is what human life is. It's small. It's a, a romantic idea to imagine they can be different from this. And we have to pursue our interests and identities within this circle of the established arrangement. And the progressives are the ones who dissent from that. The problem is that historically the dissent was couched <coughs> in terms which have become literally unbelievable. The terms of this Marxist theory of regime, that there are these big systems that are indivisible, and that we either have one of them or we replace it. So the idea of revolutionary substitution has now become an alibi for its opposite, right? This came up in an earlier class. The, we, we, the, the many countries in the world are governed by disenchanted Marxists, ex-Marxists, and they think a real revolution would be the substitution of capitalism by socialism. That's not in the cards. No one knows what it means. If it were attempted, it would be too dangerous. So what's left? What's left is to humanize the existing world. So the idea of revolution by this strange perversion is converted into its opposite, into, an, into a pretext for its opposite. Uh, given the unavailability of the idea of revolution, what remains is to manage the established order and make it relatively more humane and relatively more efficient. Uh, and then everything that is regarded as hot is then relegated to the private. So art, religion, uh, personal aspirations, of, it's the privatization of the sublime. Huh? The personal is separated from the political, the sublime is privatized. That's the larger climate. And this redrawing of the lines between the progressives and the conservatives is in the service of a different idea. Now, I think that uh, I, the third part of the discussion, which I intended for today, I intend for today, has to do with agency in the second sense. That is, who are the agents of these alternatives? And how do we think about social and political alliances in relation to these alternatives? So there I want to begin with two ideas which I enunciated in the previous class about agency in general. So the first idea is the correspondence idea. Any project of an alternative can be translated into two vocabularies that I see as equivalent to each other. One is the reverse side of the other. One is a revision of institutions and ideological assumptions. The other is the idea of a set of alliances or affinities, of coalitions. And they're not, it's not as if the second thing were just an instrument of the first. There are two ways to state the same idea. So the question I raise is this. What coalitions, what idea of coalitions or alliances is implicit in this argument about alternatives that I've been making? <coughs> And I started this discussion last week, and I now want to continue. So you can imagine three groups that are especially relevant to these alternatives in the world. So the first group are the workers, the workers headquartered in what have been up to now the capital-intensive sectors of the economy. Fordist mass production industry. In the United States, those are the so-called Rust Belt industries. Uh, and so they have available to them 
two ways of understanding their interest and identity. So this is then the second general idea about agency, the duality idea. There is a way of understanding their interests and identities which is institutionally conservative and socially exclusive. They dig into their present niche, which is the declining Rust Belt industry. And in that niche, they define the groups closest to them as their enemies the small business class, the foreign workers, the temporary workers, and so forth. The second way of understanding their interests and identities is institutionally transformative. They say, this industry here has no future. The Rust Belt industries are not coming back. The most we could do is buy a few more years for them through defensive constraints like prohibitions on plant closings, on uh, subcontracting and so forth. They're not, they're not going to return. For them to have a future, we have to convert them into something else. The project of industrial conversion then, requiring the engagement of the state, also requires alliances with the very same groups that they, under the previous understanding of their interests and identities, regarded as their enemies. So the small business class, the temporary workers, the foreign workers, have to become their allies in this project of industrial conversion. Uh, and of course, then there's this difficulty that the, 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 the institutionally conservative and socially exclusive strategy has on its side the advantage of tangibility. It's what's there. And the leaders, the politicians, the union leaders, and so forth say, how can you ask me to jeopardize my relation to my base before I have another base? I'll be left with nothing. So that's the, that's the advantage of, of tangibility. The, but it has a disadvantage that it fails to achieve the potential of the new economic possibilities and to exploit them to the benefit of a larger set of characters needs workers. <coughs> so let's say that's one group that's crucial to the coalition. I think that of the three groups that I'm going to mention, it's the least important in general in the world. So the second group are the elites. So no country in modern history has made a significant advance in growth and in inclusion or equality without the participation of a major part of the elites. And so what is crucial with respect is that there be a faction of the elites that embrace a productivist project, not just a distributivist project, a redistributive project, a productivist project. And there has to be a tension within the national elite between the productivists and the rentiers, the rent seekers, the value creators as opposed to the rent seekers. And then productivism has to be associated with nationalism, with the cause of national empowerment. Every one of these growth miracles that has happened in modern history has depended on this marriage of productivism to nationalism. So a part of the elite says, we have to take our country out of this, out of this backwardness. Uh, we, have to, we have to rise up. Uh, and we have to do that by embracing the most advanced practice of production in our historical epic and associating that productivist idea with a nationalist affirmation. So that was the case in the United States at the beginning with Hamilton's project. It was a combination of productivism and nationalism. Its democratizing character came through its contingent association with the democratization of agriculture and finance from below. Huh? We discussed at the beginning of the course. But so after the initial breakthrough of, of Britain, of the so-called Industrial Revolution, every subsequent growth miracle Every great advance 
in Germany, in, in the Northeast Asian tiger economies, in China, has had the same character. Uh, it's involved the same thing. So part of the elite has to appeal beyond the elite to a large part of the country in the name of this marriage of productivism and of nationalism. So there's a struggle within the elite, but the struggle then transcends the frontiers of the elite and acquires this popular national character. And that's then the circumstance in which it's possible to imagine a coalition supportive of these alternatives like the ones that I've described. Now the third group is the group which to me seems the most enigmatic and the most important. And that's what in an earlier class I call the subjective petty bourgeoisie. So now in every country in the world, the traditional proletariat, the industrial working class, in stable employment in the capital intensive part of the economy is a shrinking part of the population. It's a minority. It is seen by the rest of the country and ultimately comes to see itself as just one more special interest rather than as the bearer of the universal interest of society, the role in which Karl Marx cast it in the Communist Manifesto. So what is the majority? in most countries in the world. The majority is a fragmented, disorganized mass of poor people whose fundamental economic ideal by default is petty bourgeois. That is, they want to rise to a modest prosperity and independence. Uh, and in the absence of any other vehicle by which to achieve their aspirations, the default vehicle of realization is traditional, isolated, archaic, retrograde family business, the, the petty bourgeois aspiration. So it's not that they're petty. There is a petty bourgeoisie in these countries. But what I'm talking about is not the petty bourgeoisie, the objective petty bourgeoisie, the small business class. I'm talking about the mass, the majority of poor people, disorganized, but with these petty bourgeois aspirations, what, what do they want? By default, what they want is a small plot of land, a farm, a shop, a store, a family business. That's what they want. And so the question for the progressives is then how instead of demonizing them, which what is, is what the left has traditionally done to the petty bourgeoisie, to offer them an alternative menu of options, a way to realize their aspirations. So for example, when I was discussing the institutional trajectory uh, uh, that would lead from a knowledge economy for the few to a knowledge economy for the many, I spoke about a 21st century equivalent to the 19th century agricultural extension. The beneficiaries of that lift, lift, uplift operation wouldn't be simply the retrograde, small and medium-sized firms of the rear guard. It would also be the individualized economic agents who have lost stable contact to business enterprises and who would have to be transformed by this strategy of extension into technologically equipped artisans. And so they then have to be given a way of achieving this aspiration to modest prosperity and independence, which isn't just the default form of isolated retrograde family business. That's, that's, the, that's the practical question. So um, in this coalition that I'm imagining, with the workers who have stopped just hanging on to the Rust Belt industry and embraced a project of conversion, the faction of the elites that has broken with the Rangiers and embraced the productivist project and married the productivist project to a nationalist impulse and the subjective petty bourgeoisie, uh, the crucial element there in that coalition is the relation of the second to the third. 
of the dissident part of the national elite to the subjective petty bourgeoisie. Uh, that seems to me to be the vital practical question. Now your comments uh, about this. And of course, this is in some way related to the second set of remarks about the ideological debate, because if that other idea of what it means to be a progressive or a leftist is to come to life, is to exercise power, it has to be through the organization of these coalitions of this kind. This is what would bring it to life. Yes. Uh, what do you think will be the incentives from the elite to engage with this third uh, group of small business entrepreneurs? Well, I mean, the, the elite. It, 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 so the the faction of the elite that breaks with with the rentiers has to have a double interest. It has to have a material interest in its own power. It has to think that it has a much better future as, as producers than just as rentiers. But it also has to have a nationalist idea, a generous idea, a patriotic idea. I don't think that narrow self-interest is sufficient to sustain such a project. But what's typical in history is the combination of class interest with nationalist fervor. That's a large part of modern history. Uh, and I think that the, to, to go back to the example, because it's such a wonderful example of the Meiji Restoration in Japan in the uh, 19th century. A faction of the Japanese elite seizes power and it says, we have to change our ways. We have to abandon some of the characteristics of uh, uh, our customs, our institutions. We have to scour the whole world to look for the institutions and practices which will allow us to be prosperous and powerful and to resist Western colonialism. And they resisted it effectively, in fact. Uh, now, to do that, they have to go to the altar of this worldwide rivalry and tear out part of themselves, right? Uh, they have to abandon part of the national customs and become something else. So this is associated with a profound transformation of the national difference in its role in history. So the nations of the world in general used to be with tribes, as I said before, like the European nations, shaped by consanguinity and homogeneity. And now they're on some kind of path in which they're becoming something else. At the end of that journey, they would become a kind of moral specialization within humanity. That is, there's no natural way of organizing a society. Each nation is a certain way of being human and, defy and takes under the protective shield of a state. So under the protective shield of a state, it organizes a distinct form of life. That's the destiny of the idea of the nation in modern history. It starts as a tribe and it becomes a form of moral specialization. On this trip from tribe to moral specialization, an accident happens. The accident is that the tangible national identity is eviscerated. It's emptied of concrete content because the nation has to give up part of its content, of its customs, which were its identity. So I said before, to, to be an ancient Roman was to live according to the customs of the ancient Romans. Now you have to give that up or part of that. Huh? So then we have these eviscerated collective identities in which two nations live side by side and they come to hate each other 
not because they're different, but because they're becoming alike. And so when the identities were tangible and manifest in custom, they were porous and susceptible to, to compromise. When they become abstract, there's the will to difference. The will to difference survives the possession of actual difference. And it becomes the object of an intransigent faith. And that is the peculiarly poisonous character of contemporary nationalism. That it involves this, this, this contest of abstract wills to difference in the presence of the waning of actual difference. So the abstract faith, the desire to be different, is much more dangerous than actual difference. So faced with this situation, with this detour on this journey that I just described, from tribe to experiment in humanity, there are three possible responses. One response is the response of regressive right-wing nationalism. Reaffirm the traditional difference. The second is the response of liberal cosmopolitanism. Suppress difference, institutional convergence, then the nations remain different only in their habits. It's like a folklore, which is floating over the reality of institutional convergence. The third position is equip difference. Give the, give the nations of the world the political and economic institution by which they can create new difference. Because difference is not the problem. Difference is the solution. And, but then you have to have a I, 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 another idea. But the differences that we imagine and that we create are much more valuable than the differences that we have inherited. So we use the differences that we have inherited to help create new difference. Memory serves prophecy. But the fundamental direction is the creation of new difference. So I see these arguments about economic alternatives as related to that transformation and uh, the, in, in which what matters is to equip the nation, the country, with the instruments, the educational and the institutional instruments with which to create new difference. If you, as, as I said, the difference that is tangible, that is manifest, is much less dangerous and much more fertile than the difference which is simply the object of this rage, this impotent rage to be different, uh, bereft of the tangible expression, which is what increasingly we have in the world. Yes? My question concerns the second group, the elites. Yes. So is the idea of leading the country out of its uh, alleged uh, backwardness driven by sentiments of fervent uh, patriotism within the elite, or is it, is it driven by personal motives for uh, more well influence and power, which I suspect it would be? Uh, all of these, case. all of these, and many more things. Yeah. So if the the case is the latter, then is there any danger that the, the new structures constructed by the elites that brought about the change might turn into vehicles of uh, personal gains for, gains for the same elite, returning the, the state of affairs back to the insularity? Of course, of, of course there is. Of course there is. So uh, we're, we're not talking about angels. So this is real history, right? Real society in which the the motivations of any real social group will combine power for themselves, power and wealth, and for leadership in society, and identification with the nation. Because even for their own self-interest, they'll think, for us to be powerful, the country has to be powerful. We're, we're, we're traveling on this ship. Uh, and so our fate is intertwined with the national fate. Now, there are many ways in which this can be misdirected. So it's possible for the elite to have such close relations with the, the activity of the rentiers that they think, 
if we fail as producers, we can continue to flourish as rentiers. Uh, then they can have some form of natural wealth or wealth extraction, which is an easy way out. So in other words, they don't have to have a productivist project because they can simply take some precious thing out of the ground, like oil uh, or even a, a remarkable facility for agricultural wealth. So there are many ways in which they can escape this imperative of self-transformation, always. <coughs> so I think of my own country of Brazil, the, the uh, what has dominated as the progressive project there is on the one hand, genuflections to the financial interests, the financial markets, uh, and their religion of doing everything that they want, not just satisfying their interests, but following their prescriptions. And then handouts to the poor. So, pobrismo and financismo. Huh? And that's what we have. Uh, so, that, and the result is stagnation. So we don't grow. Uh, Brazil for a hundred years, from 1870 to 1970, was one of the fastest growing countries in the world, especially from 1940 to 1970. And now it's completely stagnant. And the stagnation is, is this occupied by this combination of financismo and pobrismo. Uh, so that's a disaster. Uh, so, a faction of the elite could see it being as being in its self-interest, as well in its, in its wider national interest, national commitment, to escape from that. The temptation to find these easy way outs is, a, is of course, enormous. And so, it's not surprising that in modern history, these growth miracles are the exception. They're not the rule. The rule is stagnation. It's continued stagnation. But nevertheless, the growth miracles have kept happening in modern history. They eventually do happen under some benign set of circumstances. And they produce this result of the modern world. So 50 years ago, the GDP of Brazil was greater than the GDP of China. Now it's a minuscule fraction of the GDP of China. So that dramatically demonstrates the difference between having and not having a growth miracle. And so the remarks I made were really in the service of an attempt to understand the inner logic of these growth miracles and what their social composition is. Now, today, I don't think the elite would be enough because we have this majority of the country who are what I call the subjective petty bourgeoisie. So it's a whole archaeology. We have a geology in which at, at the surface of the mass, we have a, a small business class, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial class, with a culture of self-help and initiative. Then under them, we have workers who are still poor and who work desperately. They hold two or three jobs. They work day and night. And they have assimilated this culture of self-help and initiative. And then underneath them, mass of poor people who are accept uh, co-option transfers if there's nothing else. But they hesitate, and their eyes are also turned toward this petty bourgeois vanguard, which they would like to follow if they were able to. So that's the real, the real life of a society. And for anything to change, there has to be a connection between some movement within the elites and this reality of the country. Those two worlds have to be connected in some way. Yes, back there. I was just going to ask, is there any fear of these intangible manufactured differences <coughs> potentially becoming a little bit more nefarious and hostile 
and lead to one of the first options you said. That's why I call them poisonous. Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, but my, my, my contention is that the national differences are more dangerous if they are more abstract. That is, if what you have is a will to difference, an impotent will to difference, aroused and enraged by the waning of actual difference, that's much more dangerous in its effects than the ability to create real difference. Because tangible difference is always porous and subject to compromise. It's the intangible difference that's the problem. And that's what I call this distinctive element in, in modern nationalism. And so, and then the question is, how should we respond to it? And I would argue the, the, the best response to it is to equip it, not to suppress it. Because if we equip it, we equip it in its ability to produce real difference. And real difference is what is fertile. Yes? Yeah, on that uh, topic, you spoke of, of the need for political and economic tools for nations to create new difference. Yeah. So in, in that regard, how do you view projects like the European Union and then other types of multinational projects? Yeah, well, I mean, we're, we're going to have a class about globalization, which I'll come to that. So the European Union has sometimes been offered as a model of globalization, you know, for globalization, uh, for a certain kind of globalization. But the fact is that the European Union has evolved according to the principle that the power to define the basic institutions, the economic institutions, is increasingly centralized in the government of the Union, whereas the power to define the social and educational endowments of the citizens is devolved to the national and subnational authorities. The principle of the Union should be exactly the opposite. So the idea is that the vocation of the Union should be to equip its citizens but then to allow the member states the greatest possible latitude of experimentation, including experimentation with the form of the market economy. Now, which are the countries in Europe which would have the greatest interest in this transformation in the character of the Union? It would be the Southern and Eastern European states, because they have to change their position in the world division of labor and in the division of labor within Europe. But in order to be able to force a change in the direction of the Union, they would have to be able to ally with the oppositional forces within Germany and within France. Uh, and that's, that would be a redirection of the Union. Because the redirection won't happen as a gift of the European technocracy to the Europeans. You know, and so, and what, what happens in the meantime if, when this change does not take place? is that in Europe, uh, everyone who is restless or audacious or bold or has dreams or is young or old or radical and on the right or on the left is against Europe. And Europe is in the stranglehold of the technocratic center. That's a disaster, right? Uh, it's a disaster for the project of the union because uh, life is against the union. The, the union is presided by, as it were, the dead, the half-dead. Uh, uh, and any, any more, so this is, this, is the, this, is, this, is a, this is the union that results from the dreams of Jacques Delors. Uh, and this is, this is what has to be undermined. Uh, thinking of it now as a model for globalization. So the same thing goes for the whole world. What we want is more difference. Different, I insist, difference is not the problem. Difference is the solution. More difference. Huh? And the, the positive role of the nations of the world is to embody difference and to develop it. Humanity develops its powers and possibilities only by developing them in different directions. Humanity unifies by diverging. And 
So that's what we have to organize in Europe and in the whole world. Uh, and uh, these arguments that we're having in the course are in the service of an attempt to imagine the content of these differences. So the, econ the economic institutions of a knowledge economy for the many are institutions that are fertile in the creation of economic difference. And, and a high energy democracy is a democracy capable of accelerating the production of structural alternatives. So more life, more difference uh, is the solution. We'll continue next week.